Hello, everybody. It is Donna Woods with Photonic Health. And this session of Health Made Simple is with Dr. Rihanna Fenton out of California. She is a holistic vet. And we have known Dr. Fenton for several years. Um, we've met her at a couple of the American Holistic Vet Conferences. And uh, we just were absolutely enchanted with her. She has so much valuable information and knowledge, and especially it comes to holistic health care for uh, animals. Um, and so we want to welcome you to this week's version of Health Made Simple. So thank you for joining us today. Thank you for having me on. Um, it's an honor to be able to speak. So thank you very, very much. I love working with you guys. I love what you're doing for the animals and people as well. We're definitely aligned in our vision of, you know, promoting health and healing and wellness. And that's what it's all about. So absolutely. Absolutely. So we're going to jump right in. And so what are, what's your main, what's your emphasis, your areas of em emphasis and what clients do you have the most impact on? So I emphasize mostly in our country, our medical culture and society, we're not taught how to be healthy. We're not taught what is true health. When something happens to our health, we think, oh, I got to go to the doctor or it's a crisis and I must go to the hospital. And of course, there are times when there's acute trauma, car accident, et cetera, when that is absolutely needed. But the foundation of our medical culture society, whether it's human medicine, veterinary medicine, et cetera, we're not taught, we're not brought up to think about, I need to keep myself healthy and how do I do so? And is health just physical, because I think all of us can now acknowledge and recognize it is not just physical, especially with COVID. So, and I'm actually grateful that COVID happened because it's opened our eyes and awareness to how much our emotional and mental health is tied into our physical health, right? And right. so we have learned that as humans, and but we also have to understand that our animals have that too. Our animals can only be as well as they are physically, mentally, emotionally, spiritually, psychologically, et cetera. So there's a lot of pillars here that go into establishing health in the first place that then keep us out of crisis, keep us out of having to see the doctor regularly, keep us out of having to end up in the hospital. And so there are pathways that we can take either way to health or to disease or to crisis, et cetera. And so I try to emphasize to my clients what does that truly mean? How do we set up the pathway to health versus disease? And a lot of times that has to do with diet, nutrition, our lifestyle. Are we sleeping well? Are we living in a healthy environment? What's our job? Do we like our job? Are we working too much? Are we working too little? All of those things together, that is the holistic approach. And this is just, this is just a few, but these are like the really strong core ones, right? Right. Right. So, you know, and then, you know, with horses, I know people watching would be like, well, what about chiropractic? What about acupuncture? What about saddle fit? All of those things are ancillary because if you don't take care of the first ones that I've mentioned, right. nutrition, feet, teeth, diet, housing, herd behavior, herd health, you know, do they like the horse they're living next to? Are they kicking the wall because they hate the horse next to them? All of those things, we have to consider all of that because those are our pillars for physical, mental, emotional, psychological well-being. And if we have all of that intact and we're healthy, we're less likely to get disease. We're less likely to get an infection that maybe our stall mate brings back from a horse show they just went to, right? Because our best offense, first of all, is a good defense. So if we have a good strong immune system because we're sleeping well, we're eating well, our nutritional needs have been met, um, we're taken out regularly, we're exercised appropriately, we're sleeping well at night, all of those things create health. And if one of them are missing, it can start a spiral effect and start affecting all the other things. So this is what I try to emphasize with my clients. And I, when I show up to a barn, I look at all of these things. I look at all of these things. And before I even get there, I have new patient forms that I have clients fill out that kind of give me 
a visual of what to expect and where their education level is at as far as holistic horse care. What have they been doing so far? What has the horse been through? What's its history? Any trauma? What medications is it on? What nutrition is it on? Who's their farrier? When's the last time they had a, a float with their teeth? Who did it? Was it power floating? Was it by hand? All of those things. Right. So I try to collect all that data because it gives me a, a picture of this patient before I even get there. And then I get there and a lot of it is energetic. Okay. How does this place feel where they're living? Is it, is it clean? Is it airy? Is it, does it smell moldy? Does it smell dusty? Are the horses in teeny tiny stalls? How's the hygiene of the stalls? All of those things come together, right? So that's kind of the long version of answering your what do I emphasize? Um, and and once, once I'm there with the patient and the client and I have this picture, then I go into educating them. Okay, well, I think your horse is stressed out because of these things or nutritionally deficient because of this. Let's run some blood work. Um, this leg looks a little, a little off. This hoof doesn't look like it's at the right angle. When did you last have x-rays, et cetera? So it's, it's all of that. Um, so emphasizing real health based on everything I said, and then to answer your question about what type of clients do I, what was it that I normally work with or which, which yeah, one? Like, to like, spend, like horses, dogs, cats, exotics. I don't do much exotics. I will admit I, as far as traditional veterinary medicine, I'd have to get a bunch of books out to really know what I'm like, if someone came to me with a snake, I'd say you're better off seeing somebody else, <laughs> you know, right? it's not, right. it's not my area. And if I don't know something, I will say it because I don't want to get myself in too deep on something and hurt an animal. Like that's the last thing I want. So I'd rather find someone who knows that area of medicine, be like, go to them, good luck and, and hope it all works out. But when it comes to, so horses, horses, occasionally I work on dogs and cats if the horse owners already have, you know, they have small sure. animals and then yep. the occasional cow, the occasional goat, a rabbits, you know, rabbits are so similar to horses. They colic, they're hind gut really? fermenters. Um, they get some similar diseases across the board. So they're, what's that? I said, interesting, inter I don't own any rabbits. So um, I don't know anything about them other than they have long floppy ears and they're super soft. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, um, they can colic easily, you know, and then I had a client that had a rabbit that was colicking pretty bad. And she's like, I'm not going to take him to a traditional vet. I just, she goes, they'll kill him. And I said, I understand. Okay. Bring him over. And so, uh, we did, I did some muscle testing. And for those that aren't familiar with muscle testing, it's kind of, it's the scientific term is applied kinesiology. So it's basically you're testing the ability of the body to function appropriately, the organs, the cells, the tissues, the muscles, tendons, ligaments, et cetera. So if something isn't functioning properly, and this is not diagnostic, this is not like x-ray blood work, you cannot diagnose. What it does allow is to kind of hone in on what area of the body isn't working and what does it need to get going again? So right. I, did, I did muscle testing on the bunny. I don't remember exactly what came up, but it was obviously gastrointestinal. There was stasis. There was de some dehydration. So we needed to get things flowing and gave nutrition, did acupuncture, and I think some homeopathy um, and got him through. And within two or three days, he was back to humping his toy again. So... It was, you know, and this is, it was all the same stuff as what I do for a horse. It's okay. What, how did we get here in the first place? What's going right. on? I think there were some weather changes. I think it, it was, you know, and he, I think he had some access to outdoors. He was mostly an indoor bunny and he, right. you know, he played in the house and had free roam, but anyway, so bunnies, cattle, every once in a while, these aren't production. These aren't beef production cattle. These are not dairy cattle. I live so, in suburban LA. We don't have those here. So when I say a cow, it's somebody's adopted pet. It's someone who's rescued this cow and wants it to just have a good life. So um, arthritis, um, down, can't get up, um, being abused, having had abuse. So emotional support, that kind of stuff. Right. Um, losing a baby, um, losing yeah. a herd mate, those kinds yeah. of things. Yeah. Um, and so the clients, so those are my patients, the clients that typically um, that I attract already live this type of lifestyle for themselves. They eat healthy, they exercise, they're holistic, they're conscious, they do spiritual work on themselves. 
Um, so they're looking for the same thing for their pet and they just, either they don't know how to get started or who to turn to, or maybe they have something implemented and they're like, I just want you to validate what I'm doing, that it's right and tweak it a little bit if I'm off or let's do some blood work. I want to make sure everything I'm doing is keeping my pet healthy. So it, it gives me the opportunity to meet many different people. Some people that I meet have never experienced holistic health and they come to me because they're, they've exhausted everything else. They've done the MRI, they've done the joint injection, they've done the OSFOS, they've done, they've done everything. They've done everything Western and they're like, all the vets are saying I should give up or just right. keep doing what I'm doing, but I'm getting nowhere. I'm going in circles and my horse isn't getting better. And so right. I come in and I look at all those diagnostic tests. I look at all the history and I say, okay, let's muscle test. Let's see, let's see where, what's missing here that all those wonderful diagnostic tests, and I'm not being sarcastic. We need Western medicine. I love Western medicine for the fact that we have these diagnostic tests because they give us valuable information. And so I can muscle test that information and say, okay, so on this MRI, it's showing that we have some navicular. Let's dive into these tissues a little deeper and see nutritionally, what yeah. does it need? What is it missing? Why, what's concentrating there? Is there, to are there toxins there? It's, it's kind of cool. Multiple cases of navicular, I found that it's being caused by heavy metals and toxins, GMO food. For some reason, it's, um, it's like concentrating in, in those areas and those tissues. And I don't know if it's just because there's such tiny microvasculature down there. It's kind of like when a horse gets laminitis or they eat sweet feed, right? And it causes micro right. ulceration in their gut. And then all of that starts circulating. It goes straight to their feet. They've got tiny vasculature down there. It's gravity dependent. And then it just doesn't flow back up because everything's dying and toxic, right? I right. think a similar event starts occurring with navicular in these horses, but it's so slow and insidious. And right. so I've seen that and I've muscle tested that and pulled horses yeah. out of having this downward progressive navicular disease. There's a horse that I, I um, it, it exactly follows this case. The horse had gone, done everything Western and the owner was just like, I've got to try something else. And she met me through word of mouth. I hardly advertise. So she met me through word of mouth. I started working on her horse and I would say I've been with her four years now. Her horse is sound. First of all, he's 22 years old. He is right. sound. She is cantering him. He can gallop up and down hills and he's sound and he's living, he's almost living his best life at 22. Like, oh, I love that. The two of them. I mean, it's really, it's really phenomenal. And I remember the, the, the progress over time. I remember the first text she sent me and it, my phone lit up and she goes, I took him to the arena and she said, I did X, Y, Z for the first time in however many years. And she goes, and he was sound and he did it perfect to both, you know, both directions. And so it's the, you know, really the, the clients that I love are the ones that are just open. It doesn't yes. matter if they've done holistic their whole life or have never seen it at all. As long as they are, they are open and willing to try and their resistance is just gone. And sometimes it takes a long time for them to get there. Sometimes it takes them going through a devastating crisis with their pet to be like, whatever it takes, just Dr. Fenton, just even if it looks weird, if your muscle testing looks weird, and I don't understand it. I don't get it. Just do it. If it's going to make my pet better. Okay. And then over time, what's really cool is they do see them get better and they're like, okay, how does this work? Like, right. what, what are you right. doing and how does this work? And can you do it on me? And right. That's, right. that's actually how I became a human nutritionist because I was getting such great results with their the animals that Western medicine couldn't get. And they were like, can you do this on me? And I had to go back to school and, and get, you know, certified and malpractice insurance for that and, and everything. And, and it's been cool because if the owner and the horse or the pet are on nutrition together, it's very synergistic because- Correct. When we show up, you know, our pets honestly can only be as good as we are too, because they're so sensitive to our stuff and they mirror us. Right. And they, they, sometimes they carry our stuff. They feel our energy. So if we're well, which then we're also able to show up better for them and create more well, wellness for them. It's, it's like a, it's an, it's a positive vicious cycle, right. Instead of a right. negative one. So right. that's, that's been really fun too.
yeah. as a vet. I never thought I'd have a second career being a human nutritionist. Never, I never saw that coming. Never saw that coming. Yeah, well, you know, and Brian and I never saw it coming that um, we would be, you know, like, because Brian was an engineer and a mechanical, mechanical engineer and a um, project manager for a very large corporation actually designing um, truck chassis. So, and, and I was a commercial insurance agent. So if you would have told us, you know, 20 years ago, hey, by the way, you're going to be working for yourselves and you're going to be in the medical industry and you're going to be helping people change their lives and the lives of animals, I would have, la I would have laughed. I would be like, there's no way. Like, there, thanks. That sounds fabulous, but there's no way. It's just amazing how um, that animals sort of have an agenda. And, you know, if like you said, I love there's so many parts about what you just said that I absolutely love. And, you know, at the beginning, you said that we're really have the same similar philosophies. And we really do, because when we, you know, we've got a equine certification program and we talk about every single single pillar that you have talked about, like obvious the feet the teeth the nutrition aspect of it but you know the spiritual aspect of it the emotional aspect of it if you do, if your horse is not happy it doesn't matter how much healthy food you give it how how many supplements how much traditional western drugs whatever like that horse is just never going to be healthy right. and um and it's something that you know we you know, we, Brian and I live by what we teach. Um, you know, we teach muscle classing and our muscle testing in our courses as well. And like, I love the point, it's not a diagnostic, but you know, I think the biggest thing in today's Western medical world or our medical thinking, you know, for the majority is that I go to the doctor or I take my vet, my animals to the doctor, they do a, a blood test and this is what the results say. And unfortunately, we've been brainwashed into thinking that a blood test is the gold standard. And for some things it is, but for a lot of things, it's actually not. And I know I'm preaching to the choir on that. So I love the fact that you go, hey, let's look at the bloods, let's look at the labs, um, let's look at the rads. Like that's the other thing that I don't think a lot of horse people really think of, especially when they're dealing with beet. Yeah. Let's get these rads. Like yes. let's let's yeah. not gas, let's not let's not spend needless money and hours on trying different things. Let's get rads to see to see what's going on and. Yes. It's my, and even though you, a lot of people don't want to spend that money up front, you actually, as you know, save a ton of money because you're not throwing the kitchen sink at it. Yes. Yeah. A hundred percent. I, you know, one of the things I think I find myself saying often is you either pay now or you pay later and it's, yep. so just Correct. pay now, pay now. So you know what you're dealing with, because as right. you travel down that road, you're going to make better decisions because you're going to have the information that's going to allow you to stay on the path of health instead of guessing and then, oops, okay, that was the wrong turn. And now I have this problem too. So rads are uh, invaluable when it comes to hooves. Um, yeah. I, yeah. I just, I cannot say that enough, Correct. Um, you know, because the outside and the inside of a hoof can look so different. So yeah, well, and you know, with Brian being an equine podiatrist, like he's, he's just, if he, and of course, I think we're also very similar in that we get, you know, we get the, we're the last resort calls, right? Yeah. You know, especially with Brian being a podiatrist, he gets the, well, you're the last resort um, because right. I've tried shoes. I've tried this farrier, that farrier, this person, this body worker, and and we keep spiral spiraling downward. And so, brought, you know, we get called in on a lot of those. And you know, ultimate, even though we go out there primarily for feet, we ultimately end up recommending you know changes in their diet, changes yeah. in their feed process. Feeds just are not good like not for anybody including yes. our own body yes. yes. <laughs> um yes. anyways what um as a professional out there what is the question do you find yourself answering the most well it's so funny you just mentioned um commercial feeds so oh so there's i 
I'm thinking of two particular cases right now. Um, both horses have colicked and have had a tremendous amount of intestine removed during surgery, both of them. And both horses are being fed commercial feed. And they, they say to me, well, there's no, there's no, there's no sugar, there's no molasses. And I said, are you only reading the front of the bag? Or are you going to read the ingredients too? Because that's all marketing. That's all right. You have to look at every single ingredient. And I have gone to the local feed store and I just, I was really, I was so disgusted by what is in these bags. Um, Athoxiquin, BHT, BHA, um, uh, what is it? That propionic acid, um, all these things that are known cancer causers will cause leaky gut. Um, body can't break it down. So where does it go? It gets shuttled into our cells. Um, sometimes the body makes extra fat to then hold those toxins. Fat is what holds toxins. And then people wonder, well, how did my horse get a strangulating lipoma? How did it get this fatty tumor? Um, you know, and then, you know, of course, when they're in the hospital, blood work's done and blood work doesn't look too bad or maybe after they're like, okay, blood work's great. But as we, as you said, and I love that you mentioned this, we forget blood work is not gold standard. And I tell people all the time that, you know, you can have a patient that has perfect blood work and they can have cancer and right. their jaws drop. And I'm like, you need to understand there's so many different blood panels that can be run. So when we just do a basic blood panel, we're not catching everything in the body. There are so many tests that can be run and many times should be run and they're not even mentioned, Correct. So, which is, which is unfortunate. So if anyone watching this has a horse that's colic and you have had a strangulating lipoma, or let's say it was an impaction and there was just by chance, they found a lipoma in there and were able to take it out before it ever caused a problem. Have that veterinarian test for Cushing's have that veterinarian test for metabolic disease, because there's a reason why there is excess fat being shuttled off and shunted to another area of the body and causing a problem. Most Horses that have lipomas most likely have an underlying metabolic issue. Their liver is not processing the fat. It's not producing enough bile. And the liver enzymes could be perfect on blood work. It could be beautiful. Right. The blood work could be absolutely stunning. So that's where the muscle testing comes in. So right. And the I'm, I'm going to just jump in there as sure. well, because the other component of it is, is we don't, and especially like for humans, we, we think hormones, you know, because female, specifically yeah. females, I have, I have mostly a female herd. I have mostly mares. So I only have two geldings. Um, but the other component of it is, is if the liver is not processing correctly, um, the other component of it is excess estrogen. And it's not, it's not even something that I don't even know that's being talked about. I've, ne I've never heard it talked about in the equine industry, yeah. but just from what my own personal experience, it's like, oh, well, the body, you know, if your liver's not processing, if it's not going to, through the processing the phase two, yes. you know, phase one yes. and phase two of estrogen, yes. then that causes a whole nother set of issues. And so yeah. Um, thank you for bringing that up because yeah. it is, it, it, blood work doesn't catch that stuff. No, no. And unfortunately there's no tests in equine medicine to test phase one, phase two clearance, where is it blocked, et cetera. And so it's so funny you brought that up because I actually use, so I've put together my own book of different charts, et cetera, information I've pulled off the internet and I'll muscle test these pictures. And one of the, one of the pictures is actually a picture of a liver and all the endo and exotoxins that can enter or be created by our own body breaking down stuff. And then phase one, what reactions occur, what nutrients are needed, the intermediary um, reactions that occur. So oxidative, you know, oxidation reaction, et cetera, the tissues that get then starved of oxygen and start um, having free radical damage. And then phase two, all the phases that need to occur there, your glucuronidation, your acetylation, your methylation, and what nutrients are needed for that. And so I'll go through and muscle test the horse or the dog for whoever for, okay, where are we blocked? What nutrients are needed? Let's get all this stuff flowing so that we can get the toxins out of the body, get the hormones regulated because so much of Cushing's has to do with the liver and everyone's stuck on the pituitary tumor. And it's like, you guys understand that 
toxic blood flow can get shunted to the brain. Like right. when the liver is backed up, where, where is all that stuff going? And, right. and it's very, you know, it's very true. Like if we did, um, uh, you know, autopsies on these horses after that have Cushing's, they most, many of them probably do have tumors in their pituitary gland, but how did it get there? How, no one's asking, right. how did it get there? Why did that get right. formed? And right. so you're absolutely right. Estrogen excess, leptin excess, insulin resistance, phase two detoxification completely shut down. Their pathological detoxifiers just keeps recirculating. They're not making enough bile. Bile traps those toxins. It gets it out. It promotes proper um, defecation. So now we're not getting impactions and constipation and colic and all of that. We're not getting lipomas. So, um, and all of those commercial feed bags, guess what? They cause all of what we just talked about. All right. of it, right. all of it. They right. are, they are that and how our hay is sprayed with pesticides and herbicides and colors and dyes and all that stuff before it gets shipped from preservatives, the liver has to deal with all of that. Yeah. And so yeah. it's a day in and day out bite by bite that they are taking, that they are subjected to these toxins. And then the water, the water's toxic too. What type of pipes are we using? Does the, is it well water? Is it city water? Um, all of that, our air, are they living in LA? Are they breathing in smog and pollution? Are they near a freeway? Are they living near EMF towers? All of that stuff, right? So it contributes to, to everything, but those commercial feed bags, I'm so I just can't, I cannot stand them. Um, I tell, so then the clients will ask, well, what am I supposed to feed my horse? You're taking them off right. all this nutrition. You're, they're going right. to lose so much weight. Where are they going to get their calories from? Mother nature didn't have bags of commercial feed sitting out on these plains of beautiful grassland that kept horses alive for thousands and thousands of years, millions Correct. of years, right? They're not meant to eat these grains. They're meant to eat fresh grass. They're meant to eat yeah. hundreds of varieties of species of plants that have different qualities to them, nutrition, et cetera, vitamins, minerals, soil content is different everywhere. They're grazing at the time of the year, all of that. So I tell people stick with your hay and stick with your hay pellets and then use proper nutrition on top of that, something clean, something organic, something that's not GMO, something that doesn't have tons of vegetable oil in it. If you find something that has corn oil, vegetable oil, hydrogenated oil, soybean oil, soy is so high in estrogen. I mean, that's right. another one. I had one client contact me because her horse was seizuring and they couldn't figure out why the horse had gone to, to a very well-known university and they couldn't figure it out. And I said, what are you feeding your horse? And she told me that soya, cocoa soya. And I said, I would stop that immediately. I was like, that's, it's estrogen it's creating estrogen dominance in the body and it's probably backing up the liver and it just can't detoxify and it's causing seizures. She, she actually said to me, she goes, you know, I really, I thought about that too, but they all poo pooed my idea. They said, no, that's, that's, that's not right. That's not possible. This horse was four or five years old. It wasn't even an well, old. Uh, but, but, you know, it goes back to, you know, mainstream and I, I, there's nothing again there. I don't have anything wrong with mainstream, but the media, that everything is marketed we have been brainwashed or programmed into believing that that's the only way to do it we right. just worked out we just worked it um, up in massachusetts and of course we get a lot of people coming to our booth asking different questions um and one of them was the gal's horse had gotten caught up in barbed wire fencing and um nasty gashes like down to the bone wounds on both front legs and the, they were not closing up and she had it at a leading veterinary university hospital yeah and so she goes well do you think the lights can help and I'm like well yeah obvious yes yeah yes I mean that's what you know that's what they're made to do I said but if they're at a teaching hospital a veterinary teaching hospital they should have a cold laser or something don't they and she's like her friend was a vet tech there and she goes no we we don't have that and i was just i was floored i was like you got you got and and so this is my biggest angst against that is that like these these universities that everybody looks up to 
you know, they're not open, like they're not open right. to, to different things. And so people, you know, the unsuspect, I want to say the unsuspecting public, because they have been, you know, I, I, we were first there, you know, like when we first got into horses, like our horse came down with West Nile, gosh, 20, 20 years ago when it first came out and we didn't know, we had no clue what to do. We were brand new horse owners. And so we were like, well, we'll take him to the vet. And we had a thousand percent confidence that he was going to make it through because he's like, well, he's at the vet. So now he's all good and he'll be fine. Right. right. And we ended up not bringing our horse home and but but you know everything uh, there's the, there the, everything happens for a reason yes. you know we we had just purchased our first light therapy device and the gentleman that we purchased it from was actually a vet out of australia and so he called us after the fact and unfortunately he go in a very nice term he was like well you could have saved the horse um and so we just went on a personal mission, like, hey, wait a minute, we didn't get to save our horse, but hell, we'll save anybody else's horses if it has West Nile virus, because then at least we learned something and we've made an impact. Yeah. Um, so, so yeah, so it was just unbelievable to me that in the year 2022, there's still vet clinics that are still not using red light therapy as a technology. Yeah. I know. And, and I, you know, I hear you and I agree with you. There is nothing wrong with mainstream and Western except that they're not open to us or open to other alternative stuff. I mean, we, because I have nothing against them. I have nothing against what they do or what they use. It's just like, okay. And then let's also add this. Okay. And right. then let's also try this. You right. know, I feel like it's a very, un I hope one day it gets better. I feel like yes. it's very much a one-way street right now where we as holistic practitioners are open to them and open to listening to what they want to do and how they do things, but it, we don't always get that in return. Um, and I do, yeah. I do hope that over time that changes. And I have found, I have found that as time goes on, I've been doing this for almost 11 years, um, holistic medicine. And our work speaks for itself, right? Like I said, right. I don't, I don't advertise. And so there have been many cases where I've had to collaborate with other surgeons, internal medicine specialists, board certified, whatever. And they may have not gotten through with a patient as much as they would have liked. And the owner starts using me and they see the change in the patient. And I have right. had one one very well-known and very well-respected surgeon say, I don't know what it is she's doing, but I get why you're using her. Right. And he may have not had any interest or time to, right. to say, hey, Dr. Fenton, what, what are you doing? Like, what, what are you, what, right. what are you doing? And so right. I thought that we're all busy, but it was still wonderful to at least get the acknowledgement and for the yeah. client to hear, hey, you know, I think, I, I get, I get why you're using her because basically he's saying, I see him getting better. I right. see the results, which right. I was like, okay. I was like, that's for me, that's enough. Someone's Correct. acknowledging it, commenting yeah. on it and actually in a, in an indirect way saying it's working. It's so working. It's a step in the right direction. Eventually it'll right. get there. I mean, there was another case, a horse um, that had an eye issue and he had, uveitis i mean recurrent uveitis so bad he was in and out of the hospital for a year plus and i asked the owner i said have you tested for lepto and she said no what's that i said well it's a disease that can cause recurrent uveitis in horses and she said okay i'll ask i'll ask the other vet to test and she got pushback and it was very common for her in some cases to get pushback from this one particular vet but they the test was run and it came back three out of five of the strains positive for lepto. And when she wow. asked that particular vet said, we don't really have that in this area. And it's like, it doesn't, it doesn't matter if we have it in this area or not. The horse is showing right. clinical signs and right. that disease is very, it's concurrent with the clinical signs. So right. um, she ended up bringing the horse home um, and I cared for him for about a year and a half. He was very, very close to having that eye enucleated. I mean, it was, it was bad. It was so painful. He would rub his eye on anything he could and cause massive ulceration. And right. they were just debriding the eye over and over, surgically deb debriding the eye two times a week, maybe more, over and over and over again, not getting to the root of the problem. 
And so his eye, first of all, he has both eyes. Yay. They are both crystal clear, brown, beautiful, bright, open. And, Yay. you know, it had to do it. We didn't find this on regular blood work. Remember that gold standard blood work didn't show us that this horse had right. lepto because we had to run a special panel. And so right. we also kept testing that panel and also muscle testing the eye. You know, I had to, I had to put together a big picture of the puzzle. And also let me bring up one other very important point of why I'm going to say why I have so much success in my practice on top of being trained in the human nutrition. I'm aware of human diseases that we don't recognize an animal in veterinary medicine. So leptospirosis and uveitis in humans is, can be associated with certain genetic changes such as HLA B27. So with that genetic um, marker or change, there can be a lot of autoimmune diseases such as uveitis, such as um, atrial fibrillation um, and other types of like spondylosis, um, arthritic changes, and there's what uh, rheumatoid arthritis. There's a whole there's a whole list associated with lepto. And this one client with the horse that had the eye, they had two horses, both warm bloods from the same um, genetic lines. They were related. They both got lepto. They both were exposed to lepto, and both manifested human clinical signs. So the uveitis, atrial fibrillation. Um, the spondylosis, um, ankylosing spondylitis is what it is. That's, that was, that was what these horses showed up clinically. Right. And what's interesting is the HLA B27 gene or the marker or whatever you want to call it is very common in European, um, ancestry in humans. And these horses are European. So it was just very, very interesting connecting the dots and then using muscle testing and nutrition to help with that HLA B27, to help with the uveitis, to help with the leptospirosis, viruses in the body. Um, I did ozone therapy on the horse, laser, oh, tons of laser, um, blood acupuncture once the blood was healthy enough. We, I told her, I said, why don't we use serum on the eye to help with its healing? And then I, I took a step back and I was like, wait, we can't. I was like, his blood's not clean yet. We got to get this lepto right. under control before we just put the lepto serum in his eye. But once once he was healthy enough on muscle testing, repeat blood work, CBC chem, lepto panel, et cetera, um, we started using the serum in his eye and it, you could see the neovascularization going to the ulcer to heal it. I mean, it's just, it's amazing. But nice. yeah, so that was, a, that was a case where it was like, okay, Western medicine couldn't help, but this, the, that vet that wasn't able to, to fix that, he saw the progress in this case. So it's just another right. being out in the field and doing this for so long. The work speaks for it, itself. You have to just, you have to just put one foot in front of the other as a as a yep. vet professional doing this stuff. And just remember, it's one horse at a time, one day at a time. Your work will speak for itself, and yep. eventually, people that aren't believers will hopefully start opening their minds and their hearts. Really right. opening their hearts to okay. Right. I got to put my ego aside. It's about the animal. Let me put the animal first. And I might not have the answer, but this other person might. So let's bring right. them together. Absolutely. Absolutely. I love that. If you could provide our audience with like two to three tips that they could implement at home, what, what would it be and how would it impact them or their animals? Okay. So first, First and foremost, so water. So I said earlier, you know, keeping the water clean. So um, if there's some way, I don't know how you prepare this. Um, if there's some way to send a link to people that yep, are watching absolutely this in their email, and I'll provide it to you. Um, a water filter at the end of the hose to help catch sediment, bacteria, lead, mercury, just all the yucky stuff um, that can help tremendously water is, I mean, number one, that is the number one nutrient that we all need, right? So right. as as long as that is as clean as possible, our organs aren't trying to filter out the, the yuck day in and day out. They're not being stressed. Dirty water stresses the immune system. It stresses the liver. It stresses the heart, the kidneys, the vascular system, it, the gut, all of the brain, all of it. So clean water. Um, secondly, let's see. So I would say the commercial feed bags, you got to get, get rid of them. Do hay and hay pellets. 
use hay that, you know, your horse isn't allergic to, obviously. Um, and some type of loose, not a salt block, not a salt lick, some type of loose free mineral choice or free, free loose salt. Do not put it in their hay pellets. Do not, I mean, when you go to a restaurant, you don't want the chef pouring tons of salt in your, in your food. You do it yourself based on how much you want. So the horse knows how much he needs. Just give it to him in a bucket somewhere where he can't tip it over, et cetera. And he can have free access to it next to the water somewhere. So that's important. And then as far as people are, I know people are probably thinking, okay, but what about nutrition? If he's just eating hay and hay pellets or she, find a product online. So I love standard process. Um, they make organic nutrition. They have some uh, equine formulas and that can be a great way to get some organic, clean nutrition into your horse. If you're worried about, you know, joint health, GI, metabolic, they have stuff. Um, or you can research on your own. Another company that's really good is Advanced Biological Concepts. They have organic feeds and products as well. I like them too. Mm -hmm. and I think third and, and third, so... You know, when you're driving by a vet clinic and they might have a banner, you get an email and it says, get your wellness program, get your, get your annual vaccines, your G. Get wellness. your free flu shot here. Yeah. Get your flea meds, get your, okay. All of those things are absolutely important, just like antibiotics, just like steroids. However, they need to be used appropriately. They should not be used just because it's springtime, just because our calendar says so, just because it pops up in the computer system that you need another vaccine. I don't, I think we're overusing vaccines. I think we're overusing dewormer. That's why we're having parasite resistance. Um, flea meds are absolutely important. And in the face of using flea meds, there's a lot of patients that can't take them because they have underlying liver or kidney issues. So, and that's kind of outside the scope of our talk today, but that's something that people right. can reach out to me and, and talk about if they wanted to. Um, but these, these wellness programs. So I want to talk about vaccines and dewormer in our horses. I think our horses are being over-vaccinated and that's another contributing factor to metabolic disease, Cushing's especially. Our horses don't need to be vaccinated every six months, especially if they're just in your backyard, you're not going to horse shows, you don't have horses coming in and off the property all the time. If you're horse showing, that's different because there's, there's regulations requiring people to vaccinate, et cetera. And in those cases, okay, but then you also need to give a lot of support to the liver and the kidney to get rid of the, the side, the excess stuff they put in there, the thimerosal, which is mercury, just with a nice, nicer or hidden name. Nicer name, yes. Nicer, nicer name that a lot of people don't know about. And so all those toxins, the adjuvants, et cetera, that are supposed to activate these vaccines, they're toxic. And I'm not against vaccines. I, I was vaccinated as a child. If I travel somewhere and there's gonna be a disease that could be horrible, I might consider getting vaccinated against that thing. I'm not against vaccines. I'm against them being overused and misused, just again, like antibiotics, dewormers, steroids. So we have to be mindful. We have to be conscious about how often we're using these. If if someone is financially able to do titers too on their horse, dog, et cetera, I highly recommend that because I think you'd be surprised sometimes um, what the body has shown their levels immunologically, how long those vaccines last for. Dr. Dodds did a study that showed, I think if I'm not mistaken, that the rabies vaccine lasted, it was definitely longer than the one or three year length of time that these rabies vaccines right. are given for. But right the laws are still not changing. And I understand that for rabies because it's transmissible to humans, it's deadly, there's no cure, et cetera. Understandable. However, these other diseases that are not deadly, flu, right, like all of the, that stuff. So yep. those kinds, excuse me, those kinds of diseases, it would be very smart to have titers done. And if the, the show associations could maybe accept that or start looking at that, um, right. That would be helpful. Barns, training barns, et cetera. If you have, if you have these titers and you know, the horse is on some really great, you know, nutritional support is working with a vet that's holistic or on some type of regimen, you know, has the filtered water, the, the cleaner, the smarter, smarter, more aware, conscious client trying to keep their horse healthy and is doing titer testing. Please don't force vaccines on them. They're really trying to keep their horse healthy. And one thing I think people forget is that 
the, the people and the animals that are vaccinated, they are shedding the virus. And so that, that needs to be taken into consideration too. Those aren't, they aren't just perfectly clean, devoid of that disease anymore and unable to spread it just because they were vaccinated. There's a lot of different sides and things that need to be considered pro and con against vaccines. When to use it, why to use it, how to use it, how often, et cetera. But at the same time, diet, nutrition, lifestyle, sleeping, all the pillars that I talked about, the dentist, the, the farrier, the nutrition, all of it, it needs to all be in place so that if the body's healthy, it can actually mount a proper response to the, to the vaccine in the first place, right? If we give a vaccine to a sick pet, not only does it make them sicker, but that vaccine's not going to be effective. And people right. forget that, right? right? You have to have an intact immune system in the first place for a vaccine to even have an appropriate response. And there are ways to measure that. So yeah. there's a yeah, lot. We, there's yes. a lot to consider. So back to the three things. So water filter, um, hay, hay pellets, free loose salt minerals, um, some type of organic nutritional supplement, AB, advanced biological concepts, standard process, um, and then third, really consider your vaccine and dewormer protocols. Don't just yeah. deworm around the clock. Don't use the same dewormer. Do fecal egg tests. And yes, they're not always accurate or right. It depends on if that parasite lays eggs. What time of year does it lay eggs? Is it going to get caught on this test? So, and it does because it can become more costly if you're doing the fecal testing all the time, but um, consider whether or not you're grazing your horse. Is your horse eating poop? Is your horse kept with other horses? Did you just introduce a horse that you don't know its health status? Um, probably a good idea to, you know, deworm then if they're sharing right. space and eating each other's poop possibly. And just side note, if they're eating poop, it's likely a result of not having enough enzymes. They're going back to eat the food that they didn't digest the first time. So anyone watching, just take note of that. Um, and I, I think that's, I think that's it. Those three things are super important: water, food, and then toxins. The, the, toxins. Um, you know, the vaccines, the dewormers, etc. And then, of course, teeth and feet, and housing. I love, I love that. Right? Like we could talk, we could talk, we could okay. talk for hours, hours. Yeah. I don't know how many uh, we we've acquired so many new clients just from the fact that you know, their horse or their dog had an adverse reaction to vaccinations and, you know, and then it creates a whole cascading effect and nothing else was touching it. And so they, you know, came to us or, or a horse that has a reaction and immediately they got lights on it to help provide that extra support. And one of the companies that we use, um, especially they got a fabulous liver detox product. I did an interview with the lady a couple months back. Um, it's Sustenance Herbs. I don't know if you've, um, she's, she's fabulous. And they've got a liver detox that for horses that is just, and dogs, that's just absolutely phenomenal. Um, and, you know, we're, we're right with you. Like Ryan and I, we've got seven horses. They're out on pasture 24 seven. They are on a whole, we actually feed them coconut meal. So um, and you know, three of my, three of my horses are 27 and 28 years old yeah. and they look like they're about 18 yeah. and the one I'm actually still riding, like she's just, and you know, they're happy. They're yeah. at, but you know, it, things change and, you know, you talked about her dynamics and things like that and be aware. And we don't often think of a horse sleeping like the proper sleep patterns, but one of my, we had introduced, um a gelding it, a gelding into the herd and my my one 28 year old mayor like she was literally falling down because she was so tired mm -hmm. and she had been the herd lead mayor and she's 28 so she's sort of like given up you know the whole the whole lead lead mayor thing and we really looked at the dynamics and went wait a minute we put a gelding in that's not the leader and none of none of the rest of her herd were the leaders so she was really having to step up her game and so we just literally flipped the geldings and put the more dominant gelding in and and she's just happy as a clam and sleeping you know so I love that you touch on all the not obvious things that um really make a huge difference so 
um, thank you. Like we could, we could like have like eight more of these and talk about like just one thing. I know, I know. <laughs> each one. Yeah. Um, and thanks for the recommendation on the, the drinking water. Like, yeah. you know, it, it's cheap. And, yeah. and, and, and I don't think people really realize how much uh, heavy metals and toxins come out of our water, even if it is well water, you know, our right. ground is getting saturated with it and it's getting yeah. into our water and we're ingesting it. Our animals are ingesting it and it's just this vicious cycle. Right. So um, I love, I love all of that. Um, if, if somebody has any questions and I know that my clients, I'm sure there's some of you out there that do have questions and that would like to be able to connect with you. How would you like to, how would you like them to reach out to you? They can email me at wellness at vital equine.us as in United States, or they can go to the website, uh, vital equine.us. Okay, perfect. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. This has been so much fun. And um, we really appreciate you just uh, sharing all of your, not all of it, it's just a very small portion of your experience and your knowledge and expertise in the holistic um, veterinarian world. And um, we look forward to having you on another show. I would love to. Thank you so much. It's been really fun talking with you. It's, it's always nice and refreshing when someone else gets it and when you can just speak honestly about how things are. Right. Um, so yeah, it's, you're a breath of fresh air. Thank you so much. And I loved, I loved our chat today and I would love to do it again. Yes. Awesome. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you for watching this edition of Photonic Health Presents Health Made Simple. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe, and ring the bell for notifications for all new Photonic Health videos.